Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. <coughs> We're going to start our lecture uh, on, on, on memory. We're just going to continue from where we stopped last week. Uh, but before we start, just wanted to make an announcement. So Maureen told me that you agreed on a date for the exam, and it will be a physical exam, and I think the date is uh, 10th of May. Okay, so um, that is a Monday. Yeah, 10th of May is a Monday. We'll start at, because that's the day when uh, also the computer engineers are able to do the whole class. Uh, we are going to start at 10 uh, here at SEDAT. Now, <clears throat> I've actually wanted to give you a few other assignments, but I've had issues uh, getting those into the system into Muwele. Uh, but we'll continue, and uh, when those come, uh, they'll come and you'll be able to do them. But please prepare for the test. Now, <clears throat> we want to look at some examples of ROMs. So last week we looked at ROM timing. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, how uh, read only memory works. Uh, so for instance, uh, the critical uh, inputs, uh, where the address inputs and the control inputs, and then you get your data output. Uh, I think this is a read operation, uh, mainly because when we are dealing with read-only memory, we, we are reading. Uh, we, we are not really writing, although uh, that's not a blanket statement because sometimes we are able to write into ROM. Uh, some of the ROMs that we are going to look at, uh, the number or the frequency of writing is much less than the frequency of reading. And so they are wrong. So in fact, we're going to find that all semiconductor uh, uh, memory uh, devices uh, where the number of times that you read is more than the number of times that you write, we just tend to call them read-only memories, but it's not true that we never uh, write into uh, into ROM. So let's look at some examples. Uh, there is the mask programmed read on memory. Uh, this one is, um, as you can see, it uses some type of transistors as their cells. So uh, you know that uh, a flip flop is really made up of transistor electronics. So <clears throat> um, what you have is uh, mask programmed read on memory, which we can call uh, MROM, although they are commonly referred to as ROM, just ROM. So usually when they say ROM, they actually mean uh, MROM, and uh, we can use the two names uh, as well interchangeably. Uh, but you can see here uh, that you have an array of four by four, okay? Meaning that at each of these locations, uh, there is a cell where you can keep a bit of data. 
And so we have uh, columns, okay? So we have these are columns and these are rows, okay? So we need to be able, and really uh, the columns give you the word, okay, word size. So in this case, the word size is four, and this is D3, uh, D2, D1, and D0. And so we need to be able to select between the rows so that when we select row zero, for instance, then the word stored in row zero uh, can come to the output, okay? Because remember, we are reading once again. Now, how do we uh, select between four rows? We can use a decoder, and usually this is um, a one of four decoder. One of four means that one uh, row will be selected out of the four possible rows. Uh, and if it's a one of four, then its inputs are going to be two. So A1, A0 can change from 0, 0, 0, 001, 1, 0 to 1, 1. Okay. So depending on which uh, input you have at the input of the decoder, one of those rows will be high, the other ones will be low. By being high, it means it's been selected. Um, now, the mask is like a stencil. If you know stencils that we use to write things on, uh, uh, like uh, scribble things on, on some equipment, uh, that stencil is similar to the mask. So you have this substrate, and this is done at the industry, and you, you pre-select and say that I'm going to store a one here, I will store a zero here, I'll store a one, and our store is zero. Then you give this to the manufacturer and when they are manufacturing this ROM, they burn that within the memory. It is called uh, burning in, you know, you burn in the data so that all of the time, you always have a one here, a zero here, one is, and a zero here. And then you could choose that for row four, you want to have a one, you want to have a zero and a zero and a zero for instance. And once that is burned into the ROM, uh, during manufacture, it will always remain there. You cannot change it. If you want to change the program within the, in that ROM, it means that you have to throw it away and get a new one. You cannot unburn things that have already been burned in the uh, mask programmed uh, read-only memory. So this is what you see here. Uh, so for instance, let's say that we have selected row zero. That means row zero is high, the others are low. If it is high, uh, and then you can see that, I think that's the source. You can see that this terminal is connected to VDD. Okay, I think you know the difference between VDD and VV, VCC. Uh, that is connected to VDD. So when this is high, when you have a one here, that power is able to cross to the source, uh, to the source terminal. And that source terminal, you can see it is connected, for instance, D3, meaning that D3 now reads it. Actually, D3, there is a potential difference to ground here. So D3 is right above. Uh, it is right above that resistor. So by burning in, what we do is on the mask, you can choose to make this a one and to make it a one, it means the connection here is maintained. You can see that connection is maintained, that connection is maintained. If you want to store a zero, this connection will be burned, it will be broken. So that even if the, you have selected row three and it is a one, uh, meaning that this VDD, you can see it is connected to VDD here, that one, meaning you have VDD here, but it cannot cross, okay? Because that is an open circuit. So the power cannot cross, the voltage cannot cross, meaning your D3 would now be uh, zero. Let's see if I can uh, open a new slide uh, and, 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 and we look at this again, okay? Um, so let us look at what is actually burned within here. If you look at row zero, uh, wait. Yeah, let us look at the decoder. We have A1, A0, and then we look at rows, okay? And we look at uh, the data. And this data is D3, D2, D1, D0. Now, decoder, if it is decoder zero, zero, we have selected row zero, okay? That is the row that is selected. It means these rows, the other rows are zero. They are, they are low, 
And if it, if you have a zero here, we already said that that power cannot cross over that. There is a, the, the, that's how the, the transistor will work. But I'm not here to teach transistors. So let's continue with, uh, with digital electronics. Now, it means that the data that is stored in these transistors, these four transistors will actually move all the way to the output uh, because these ones will not interfere with that since power. Uh, the power, yes, they have VDD, but actually that VDD cannot cross uh, to that line, right? So it means that if you look at Q0, Q0 will be actually, it's, uh, yeah. So Q0 is actually connected to D3, so that's fine. We have a one because that is, if this is a high, if you have a high here, this VDD will cross to the source because that is actually, um, a, a circuit. That circuit is connected. So you're going to have a one. This one will always be zero because VDD will never cross this junction since it is an open circuit. Uh, you have a zero there. Then here you have one and then you have zero. Uh, Catherine, the difference between VDD and VCC, there is no difference really. It's that it's just uh, the symbol symbolism. So VCC is used in TTL and when we work with MOS, we usually use VDD. Uh, uh, I think uh, everyone should know that, uh, but yeah, that's really, it's a simple difference, but we are, you know, same voltage, really five volts. Now, if we look at row, if this was zero one, the decoder is going to select uh, row one, okay, which is that row, which means that this row will be high, okay, so you have a one, 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 one. That means that what, and of course this terminal now is connected to VDD, this one. Meaning that wherever it is a one, it will cross over. This power should cross over. Now in this case at Q4, it will cross over because we have a circuit. So you have a one, but this is not connected. So a zero, a zero, and then a one. Yes, the VDD will cross over, but you have an open circuit, meaning that the current will actually not uh, cross to come down here. For that one zero, we select row two, and row two, you can see it's a one, a one, a one, and a zero, one, 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 zero. And for row three, we will select that when we have a one, one going into the decoder, meaning we select row three, and then we would have zero, one, one, one. I don't know, <laughs> I, I don't know because we had this issue last week. Now, when I recorded the video actually and looked at it, it seemed to work, okay? It seemed to work. So it could be your connection. Uh, it could be your individual connection that is uh, giving you problems. I'm not very certain that it is me, uh, that the problem is with me. But if the problem were with me, then I wouldn't be able to solve it uh, anyway. I would probably just have either to stop writing so that I, conf I, I don't confuse you. But the problem is if I don't stop writing, how do I teach? <laughs> it is very hard. Uh, and so it might be an individual issue. Um, are, are there any students that are having a better experience? Yeah. If uh, Slivia is fine, I see Mary Akello is fine, then it means that the issue is not here, okay? Uh, I would encourage you guys to find places with better networks next time so that if you are using your phone, that could be an issue, okay? Um, and if you are in a place with no net, with poor network, that could be an issue. Uh, so please try and uh, improve the connection uh, at your side. But really there is nothing I can do. I'm actually at Makere University connected to Mac Air. Oh, what we've just been doing is actually already here. Now let, let us look at an example. We can use um, mask programmable uh, read-only memories to store mathematical functions. So a mathematical function is a function that always gives you the same answer every time. So I know cosine of 45 is whatever, 0 0.707, or sine of 20 degrees is, it is always that number. And so you have these mathematical tables or function tables where things always 
repeat themselves uh, because that's a function. Now, we can use ROM to store such information which never changes. Actually, that is the main application area for ROM, being able to store things that, don't, that do not necessarily change. Now, you have a function like y is equal to x squared plus 3. How do you store this in ROM? We know that in ROM, we have outputs and we have inputs. And these inputs could be address. Actually, usually what they do is that they make the address input of this ROM the, the function. You know, when you say uh, fx, okay, you could say y is a function of x. Usually this is the variable. This is the small variable that var when it changes, it varies y basically. So usually the inputs are x and your outputs become y because it is y that you want, it is x that you have. Now the inputs are very easy to, to predict because those could be like, um, <clears throat> like uh, the, the inputs could be your address, address bits. So usually first of all, what you do is, and in fact, in the question they say, assume that the input address supplies the value of x and the value of y is the output. Okay, now we can say that let uh, my addresses be two. Let addresses, for instance, be two, a one, a naught, and we know these can change from zero zero, zero one, one zero, and one one. So when the address is um, a one, a naught. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, sorry. Uh, the decimal, you could say the decimal equivalent of this is 0, 1, 2, 3. So what is y? y is uh, x squared plus 3, but you remember this is x actually. So x squared plus 3, here it will be 3, here it will be four because x squared one squared is one plus three is four once x squared here is going to be four plus three seven and here it will be nine plus three which will be 12. now because 12 is you cannot decode 12 using three bits but you can decode 12 using uh, four bits so then we can say that our output now this can be zero zero one one meaning we need four bits uh, D3, D2, D1, D0. Uh, 4 will be 0, 1, 0, 0. 7 will be 0, 1, 1, 1. And 8, and sorry, 12 will be uh, 1, 1, 0, 0. So this is how you know how you can. Now, it means that every time you give the address as 0, 0, the output will be that data. So the information that is stored at address 00, zero is that data. The information stored at zero 01 is that data, and so on and so forth. Uh, I just want to help us. I want to see how we can now program our read-only memory, our mask programmed read-only memory. So now I see that, for instance, when I'm doing 00, zero my output is 0, 0, 1, 1. So for 0, 0, my output is 0, 0, 1, 1. And this is the decoder. Obviously, this is going to be row 0. Because if I have my inputs as 0, 0, I'm going to be selecting row 0. So I would break this. Because remember, this is D3, and that's D0. And this is D3, D0. So D3 needs to be 0 if I select row 0. Uh, this I will break, so that's good. It's already broken. This one I'll connect, and that one I will connect. For 0, 1, we have seen that we have 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay? It is 0, 1, 0, 0. And it is row 1. So for 0, 1, I'm going to select row 1. And I will break that. I will leave this connected. I will break that. And I will also break that. And so on and so forth. For row three, we have seven. So for row three, for row two, sorry, it is zero, it is one zero. Row two. 
and the data is 0111. So it means I'll break that. I will keep this connected, this keep connected and keep that uh, connected and so on and so forth. And so you can see what they program, but the catch is that every time I have programmed this, every time I use it, I know it's almost like you know what you expect because it doesn't change. And so this is the information that has been burned into the ROM and it will always be uh, the information uh, that is burned in the ROM. Now, sometimes you have a scenario like, um, uh, like, um, okay, so let's say my equation was actually y is equal to x cube plus, plus two. Okay, x cube plus two. I can say a naught a1, okay, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. That means my x is actually 0, 1, 2, 3. And my y becomes now uh, 0, not 0, it's actually 2, because 0 cubed is, is 0, uh, 2. 1 cubed is 1, 3. 2 cubed is 8, plus 2 is 10. 3 cubed is uh, 27, plus 2 is 29. Now, here you have an issue because whereas this can be decoded using four bits, this one requires five bits. And so that means that your data here will be uh, D3, D4, D3, D2, D1, uh, D0, okay? And, and then you can go uh, further and, 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 and find, you know, so this one will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, for instance, 3 will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, uh, 10 will be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Is it? Yeah, so that's eight plus two is 10. And then 29, which is, yeah, whatever, whatever it is. But my point is that depending on the output you get, you need to code it using the right number of uh, binary digits. I've seen in the past where people have taken the example as it is and they think everything must stop at four. The other thing is that obviously this, also you might ask why are we always using only two input bits? As you can see, the example we've just used requires two input bits, and obviously this will give you, um, uh, it's actually really a four uh, by four uh, RAM, uh, ROM, MROM. I could have said what about if I have 16 by four MROM? This is, this. if I've described the memory, that is the one that decides how many uh, uh, inputs. Okay, so that is one, one. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, one, one, one. Uh, one, 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 zero, one. Okay, so you have your table like this. This shouldn't be ambiguous. Okay, let's move on. Now there is the idea of the, the, now before we move on actually, let me say something about this. The problem with the mask program, mask program is that you create a stencil. So you can do your design here and send your design to China and you can even send them just a, a, a table, a truth table. And then for them, they are going to create for you a mask. The problem with the mask is that it is very expensive. For it alone, it is very expensive to manufacture. And so it only makes sense if you basically when they have a mask, then they use it to reproduce many memories, M rooms. So it makes sense if you're going to produce so many units so that it cuts down on the cost per unit. But if you're going to design an M ROM and produce five memory pieces of memory, then you're going to spend thousands of dollars for just five pieces of memory. Um, and so to alleviate that problem, they came up with a, 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 a ROM that is called programmable ROM. It is almost like MROM. The only difference between MROM and PROM is that MROM is 
is, is, is programmed by the manufacturer at the manufacturing stage and the PROM is, is, is programmed by you. So what they do is that they create the same kind of setup, but here they put fusible connections. They put like a fuse, all right? Now you know a fuse, how it works. They put a thin wire and so you can burn it or you can leave it. That means that they put a fuse, okay, instead of having a, a very solid connection. And when you go, and then they manufacture those things and so many people buy them, you know, from anywhere, from anywhere, any part of the world. That makes sense to the manufacturer because they can make that and sell to everyone. The problem with MROM is that it's you, the customer, that, pro, that gives your own design. Your own design may not be of interest to somebody elsewhere. It means it's only serving you because it is specific to your needs. This one, they create the whole template and they leave fusible links at every node. Okay, so all these would be fusible nodes, sorry, fusible links. And what you do is once you do your program, you reach your lab, you choose which one to blow and which one not to blow. If you choose to blow this one, it will all restore binary zero. If you choose to leave this one, it will all restore binary one. But you do this in your own lab, or maybe you have some specialized equipment that can allow you to do this. So you can ask the manufacturer to blow uh, them for you, but they will obviously charge you for that service. Now, this is called programmable ROM. The only difference with the PROM, with the MROM, is that this one is you do it yourself. So they manufacture these and people pick them and go and program them according to their own needs. However, once a PROM has been, has been programmed, it cannot be erased. You cannot go back and reprogram because once you blow a fuse, you have blown it. it can, you cannot unblow it. <laughs> you cannot put it back. Um, and so, but this really alleviates the issue of having a huge cost on an individual because now uh, the manufacturer will manufacture many of these because they can serve many people out there. And then each cost, each unit will be a lower cost if you are buying fewer pieces, for instance. That is a programmable read on memory. If you want to change the memory that you burned into that program, into that chip, you have got to buy a new chip. You cannot reprogram it. The weakness is obviously of these two, and you can go and see how they, they actually uh, program these. So you'll be reading the theory. There's a lot of theory around this about how they program it. These things are very difficult to bring, but I usually bring a few bits and pieces uh, in the objectives. So I would say that you should try to read through the, 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 the notes and, and, and try to understand enough to pass. Um, the, diff the, 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 the way that they tried to solve these issues of not being able to reprogram was to create an erasable programmable read on memory. So it means you can program it yourself, but there is the concept of erasable, you can erase. So this one wouldn't use fusible links because if you have blown a link, you cannot recreate it. It's not, it is not going to work like that. Uh, so you can read about the theory of this to see how are they able to reprogram this, but actually it's that they capture some charge somewhere and then they can release it and and ch 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 change the, the, the cells where they, they put back that charge. So you can go and read that and you can see they use uh, ultraviolet erasing. So you just expose this to some ultraviolet signal, which erases everything and you reprogram afresh. I'm actually more interested, and now you can see this one has two uh, input voltages. This is for normal operation, VCC, meaning this is TTL, and VPP is for programming. So when you are going to program, you use VPP. Usually VPP is higher voltage, like 12 and a half, sometimes even 21 volts. Whereas for VCC, we know it's five volts. That's for normal operation. Let us look at some uh, of, let us look at how this would work. First of all, it has three control inputs. Uh, it has the program programming input. So if you're going to program, you need to make this a zero, as you can see it's active law. This is always going to be high until you are going to program. By programming, I mean, maybe you have erased it and you are going to uh, reprogram the memory. Uh, or the data that is kept within that ROM. You have the chip enable. Chip enable, you know what it does. Actually the chip 
deselects the whole thing. It can, if your chip enable is, is low, it means the chip is selected. If the chip enable is high, in other words, it's inactive, the chip is deselected. So everything inside there just goes to sleep. And when the chip is deselected, it, it, it is in a, what we call a low power mode. It consumes very low power, uh, low power mode. So actually this chip, chip enable is really good when we start combining them to create bigger memory. So we are going to see that in the next few uh, lectures, uh, but it is an important input uh, that you'll find a lot with uh, memory devices. Now the output enable, is like going to manage only the output buffers. If my output enable is zero, it means my output nodes are not in high Z state. If it is one, that means I've put my output uh, terminals in the high Z state and they are not going to work for you. If you're reading, remember we are re reading with the, with the ROM, the information will not reach the bus for the CPU to pick it up because the outputs are in high Z state. So if you are looking at these control terminals or control inputs, you would say that the program or programming input is always high until you're programming, then you need to put it low. Uh, the chip enable clearly supersedes the output enable. The output enable only works on the outputs, on the buffers, whereas the chip enable can select or deselect the whole chip. Okay, so that is really critical. And as you can see, this is 8K. And 8K memory cells, uh, that's 2 to power 13. 2 to power 13 is 8K8192, I think 8192 or something like that. So that's why we have address inputs from A0 uh, to A12. Those are 13 different, and the eight obviously are on the output. If you look at this, if we are reading, this is the normal operation. We need to, first of all, select our chip. So C is zero. We need to enable the output, okay? Because we are reading, so the outputs need to work. And then we don't need to be programming. So that's always high. We are using normal v VCC 0 to 5, and we will get our data at the output. If you are disabling the output, everything is the same, but the output enable is high. If it is high, it will be disabled because it is active low and then your outputs will be in the high Z state. In standby mode, the one I talked about, the low power mode is also called standby mode, the chip enable will be high. If the chip enable is high, we don't care what these are, but the outputs will definitely be in the high uh, Z state. When we want to program, we need to select our chip. We also need to to switch off the terminals actually, because now the output is not necessary since we are programming. And so that's a one and obviously program is zero and you can see we program at a higher voltage and then we have our input, uh, our data input. If we want to, pro to verify what you have programmed, uh, you need to be reading from the memory. And so this is the reading command, but you still do it at a higher uh, voltage. Uh, Ellen uh, Nakasoma, back to MROM, how do we choose input addresses? Actually input, I sort of talked about it actually. So here input addresses, we can see there are two, just two input addresses, uh, which is A1, A0. And these will you obviously change from zero, zero all the way to one, one. I said that this, the reason is because we are basing our example on this scenario where the number of bits are four, but the number of words are also four. So word one, word two, word three, word four. And if you are looking at word four words, you know, you need two uh, bits for addresses. However, uh, if we had like 16 by four, for instance, then we would need uh, four address bits. And then your table would be from 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1. I hope that uh, that answers uh, your question. Yes, on the program, so the programming is actually this one. 
when when i receive my chip obviously you're going to have uh another one maybe like that let's say we are drawing uh our um, okay this is vdd uh and then you know it comes with a fusible link before that the manufacturer was either blowing this for you or keeping it intact but now all these nodes have uh, have these fusible links and it is up to you to blow whichever ones you want to blow and keep the, the the others intact if you want to keep a zero in a certain cell you have to blow that if you want to keep a one you leave it intact so the process of programming is really choosing and implementing uh a, a, a store by, by storing a zero in a certain memory cell or a one in a certain memory cell so if i come here and i want a one here i leave that intact if i want a zero here I blow it. If I want a, he, a one here, I leave it intact. That is really the process uh, of programming. Another question, throw some more light on EEPROM operation. Uh, the EEPROM, erasable. No, more light you'll find it from the books. But what I said is that with the EEPROM, you're able to erase the whole memory and reprogram it. That means that you do not have fusible links because we say that if you blow a fuse you cannot reconnect it so the point of erase you see erasing would be like going back to the original state and reprogramming afresh we would not be able to do that if we had fuses and so it is very i think uh, easy to infer uh, that you would not have fusible links similar to like mrom or uh, prom in an eprom However, I say that you should go and see how they store either a one or, or a zero and are able to uh, erase that using UV light. You expose the memory to UV light and it erases that and you can reprogram afresh. I think it would be the same. A fusible link, I'm reading it because usually when you, a fusible link means that you, you have a fuse. So if you look in your plug at home or you know, the plug in your laptop, there's a fuse that connects two terminals. That's a fusible link. If there's a problem with power, if it is an over voltage, it will blow so that it protects the rest of, of, of whatever is behind it. Uh, and so I think meriting, I've never really had the, the term meriting link, but usually when we have a fusible link, we can merit it and then we have an open socket so it sounds like it would be the same uh Arvin. now we have another one the problem with the eprom is that for you to reprogram it you must get it off the socket and go and reprogram it separately you cannot separate you cannot reprogram it within the socket what i mean is imagine you have a motherboard and it has many sockets and you would need to take off that EEPROM, take it elsewhere, reprogram it, and bring it back and put it back on your motherboard. Uh, but the, the reprogramming is very quick. You know, the erasure is very quick and the reprogramming is very quick. You'll get to know more about this. Now we have an electrically erasable PROM. That is called EEPROM, electrically erasable PROM. The erasable prom before we saw it was being erased using UV light, UV ultraviolet light. Now the electrically erasable prom is erased using electrical means. It does, you don't need some external light source to, to do that. You can use some electrical means uh, to erase it. Now the advantage of that is that you don't need to take it out of the circuit to erase it. It can be erased in a circuit. That is a big advantage. The problem with it is that the erasure takes longer. Okay, it is a longer process, and so although and also they are really a bit because now with the electrical erasure, uh, to be able to erase the 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 the, the EE prom using electrical means, it means you need some more circuits that perform that erasure, and that's usually within uh, the prom, and so you find that the substrate becomes bigger. So for the same capacity the EE prom tends to be bigger in footprint or, 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 or in size, physical size than the EEPROM. And because of that, much as the EE prom sounds like it's better in terms of being able to erase within circuit and, and so on, the disadvantages are it is slow 
uh, in erasing and also um, it is bigger you tend to have a bigger substrate because there are other uh, circuits that come with that because of that reason it hasn't managed to overtake the EEPROM the way it was meant to be okay because it was meant to overtake the EEPROM and bring those advantages but because of its big size uh, it hasn't so much as taken over completely. However, it has its own uh, advantages as well. Now you see you have 8K, meaning you have your 13 address bits. You have your control inputs, output enable, chip enable, and write, read, write. You can see that this is WE, meaning sometimes we read. In fact, this is one. So usually because we are, usually this terminal is kept high, okay? so that we are reading because it's a ROM. And we only put it down, we switch it down when we are going to write. Okay, so write enable. So that terminal connect, uh, th these are the three control inputs. CE determines whether we are in a standby or low power mode or in normal operation mode by selecting that. So chip enable, you select by putting it to zero and then you have your output enable, uh, which is also going to control the uh, outputs. Now, we have these interesting uh, terminals here. These are called, when you see IO, it is input output terminal. It means you can use the same terminal for input as for output. And the good thing with this is that because it is electrically erasable, you can, now when you are going to burn data, you can just pass it through the same uh, terminals. But we've seen that these two operations cannot happen at the same time. So you cannot really be trying to write and you are reading at the same time. So information is never going to uh, interfere on those bus, uh, on those bus links. Nan Samba Rachel, uh, I'm once again happy to explain this last time. Uh, maybe you may have dodged a class before, but we say 8K by eight, this is the word length. We are not interested in this word length. This is the number of words. And each, each word needs its own unique address. These are number of words. So if we have 8K words, each word needs a unique address. We need to find enough address to uniquely identify 8K words. 8K is really, eight is two to power three. It is eight times K, okay? And we know that k is 10, 2 to power 10. So this is 2 to power 13. That's how we know that the number of uh, bits per address is 13, 13 bits. So you can see that this is really pretty much the same table. We are not going to dwell on it. Let's look at some timing uh, diagram for EE operation. <clears throat> we start at T1. Time T1. At time T1, we want to write, because remember usually we are reading, but now we want to program, okay? So this is the programming operation. So first of all, you give the address at this time, the new address where you want to write. And then, you know, we usually leave a small time for the address to be stable because you know you if it was a zero and it's turning to a one it needs to shift up to something beyond uh, the halfway mark for it to, to stabilize within its new state now we need to enable the chip and we also need to give the right enable the output enable will still be one because we are writing we are not reading so we don't care about the output now the data io in fact, in this case, it will be data in because we are feeding the data that we want to write into the memory. So when the chip enable has gone to a low and our write enable is also low, at some point we give the data that we want to write into that memory. And after some time, we can disable the write enable again and disable the chip. Maybe we, yeah, we can disable or deselect the chip or we can keep it, you know, this could continue at zero. It doesn't matter. But at some point we need to stop the writing. However, this is enough time for the memory, for this information here to be written into that address there. That's why you see they overlap. But if we are not going to continue reading or writing, 
then usually you put the chip in standby mode and by standby mode we mean you take the chip back to uh, to zero so the information will be written into that address maybe at some point we want to read or we want to write i think these timing diagrams now are quite second nature to you uh, today we may just do one hour because um, ever, I'm so busy trying to, to do some stuff. So we might do one hour of lecture, uh, but, but that's okay. We, we've already covered more than 70% of the course, so we are well on our way. Now let us look at another interesting uh, read on memory, the CD-ROM. This is the one we were talking about last week, although we said that for some CD-ROMs, they are rewritable, meaning that they are not going to probably use this uh, technology. Okay. Now with the CD-ROM, you can see they use a very shiny uh, surface, very shiny and very smooth. And then let me try to draw a ROM, a CD-ROM, you know. And then what they do is when you are writing, you use a laser. And you and on each spot. So this, if you were to blow up something, there are going to be certain spots, uh, maybe a certain distance apart from each other. And for each of these spots, you are going to make it either a zero or a one. You make it a zero, you know, you make it a one by digging a little pit. By digging, I mean you put a high powered laser that burns that area and creates a small pit. A pit is like a small depression. And so here I've stored one. Maybe in the next spot, I don't do anything. But when I'm reading, I will read that as a zero. In the next spot, I put another pit. That's a one. So in this spot, I've put a zero. That will be a one. If I dig another pit, that's a one. And another pit, that's another one. And then I jump there, that's a zero. I jump, that's a zero. So where there's this little dot, just imagine that the laser did not dig. That's because it wants to put a zero. And it will, this data will be written in a, in a spiral fashion, okay, all around, uh, all around the disk. Now that is during writing, you use a high powered laser. During reading, you use a low power laser. Now this power laser, what it does is that it, uh, it, it obviously uh, has a source of light, but very low power light. And when the light goes into the depression, the reflected light is different from the reflection from a surface that was not, uh, that was storing a zero in meaning it, it didn't have a pit. And that's how the reader is able to tell based on that reflection, what is stored at, a, at a zero, what is stored at a pit, what is stored at a place with no pit. And then you're able to get your data back. But once you have already dug pits in these places, you cannot really uh, remove the pits you have got to, um, that's why it is read-only memory. You can't really reprogram it. And so I want to give you an assignment, a small assignment really for your own personal interest that you go and find out how different the, the rewritable CD-ROMs are. How are they programmed? Okay, I, 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 I'm giving you that as an assignment before you ask me. <clears throat> Finally, on ROMs, finally, we have flash, flash memory. I think the idea of flash is that it's fast. You know, I think this came from the, 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 the cartoon, <laughs> the, not the cartoon, the superhero. I guess they are cartoons as well. But with flash memory, you have, they are, flash memory is non-volatile, but of course it is ROM and we know ROM is non-volatile. It is high capacity, uh, high density, um, uh, uh, memory and it is also low power. It consumes much less power. And now we see flash memory almost everywhere. It's in your phone, it is in the computer, it is the small USB stick that you use is, is flash memory. In the past, having flash memory was very expensive, but right now we see flash drives of 16, 32 GB, 64 GB, I think even bigger perhaps. So you can see uh, since the book was written today, a lot of uh, improvements have happened to the extent that we are starting to buy uh, 32 GB memory sticks at less than 30K. 
you know, uh, 30 K that's less than $10. So this memory has become very cheap indeed. And most of it is going to be running now in things like ovens at home and uh, cash machines in the, in the supermarkets and so on. But they work essentially the same way as the other memories that we've seen. Uh, when you are programming or when you are writing, you're going to use VPP. When you are reading, you're going to use VCC. Uh, it is 32K, so it has 15, uh, 15 32 times 1024 is 2 to power 5, and this is 2 to power 10. So you have uh, 2 to power 15 is 15 addresses. Uh, that is for the, the, just to emphasize for the student that was a bit confused. You have your control inputs. They work exactly the same way that we have talked about. And so this table should be very easy for you to understand. Now, <clears throat> the good thing with, with Flash is that you can erase the whole thing and reprogram it, or you can erase bit by bit. You see before, those others you would have to erase the whole thing, like the EEPROM, you erase the whole thing and start afresh, even the EEPROM. But perhaps, the, no, no, the, EB, the EEPROM, it's possible to erase certain parts of the, of the memory and only program those, so it's possible. Uh, but the, the flash memory also has the capability that you can erase certain bits of information without erasing the whole thing. We can talk about bulk eraser, or you can talk about um, more targeted erasure of data, uh, and and Flash uh, can uh, can support this. Uh, if you look at this, <coughs> this is device complexity and cost. So EE proms are costly, but this cost obviously now might be cheaper. Maybe that book was written eight, ten years ago. I have edition 12, so maybe eight years ago. So EEPROM used to be very expensive and obviously very complex because you have the electronic circuits that enable you to erase within circuit. That's why it becomes, it's a large uh, physically. However, the advantages are, you know, MROM and EEPROM cannot be erased or reprogrammed. Once you've programmed them the first time, that's it. Uh, EEPROM, you can use UV light to erase everything, and you, but you would have to reprogram out of circuit. Uh, flash, you can program in circuit, you can electrically erase by sector or in bulk. Okay, the things we've talked about. Whereas this one is also in circuit, but you can erase electrically byte by byte. So you can erase specific pieces uh, one at a time. Uh, uh, before we leave this room, uh, what did I want to say about them? Uh, there is one thing. Oh, we can also say that um, these are read mostly memories. Okay, most of the time you are reading, uh, and as opposed to writing, all these can be uh, encompassed under ROM. So really, ROMs can be memory devices that are non-volatile and where the number uh, or the frequency of reading is way higher than the frequency of writing okay so but we just generally refer to all of them as as ram let's look at some applications and i think we'll end with these applications as much as i really want to continue teaching you you know i i i, I need to take care of of some university business now these are, are things we've already talked about. So we are going to talk about them again. Embedded microcontroller program memory. Most of these electronic, most of these electronics usually have a, a processor, a microprocessor. So the microwave has a processor, uh, a, 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 a MiFi has a processor, your phone has a processor. Uh, you know, these little gadgets, PDAs or Kindles have processors. These are some of these are really powerful flash processors. Uh, but usually you'll find the modern ones have flash memory. And that processor carries a set of instructions that tell it how to perform. A cache register always does the same thing. It never changes because the, 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 the program within its memory is the same. Um, okay, and, and the microwave also functions exactly the same way. Can you imagine if you told the microwave to, to start and it can't do it, you know? So, so it always does the same thing. Data transfer and portability. 
uh, I think this one is very easy. You're looking at uh, being able to transfer information, for instance, on your flash disk uh, or, or putting, in, uh, putting music on your... Uh, in the past, we had Walkmans, you know, a Walkman. If you had a Walkman, you know, you're probably from a rich background or you store. But today you put your music on, um, <clears throat> on your phones. Actually, after Walkmans, people go to these, uh, were they called iPods or something? The, the iPhone little players. Uh, uh, but times have changed and you can see now you can put your music on your phone. But still, even then, it is like transferring. It is storage. It is transfer. Bootstrap memory is interesting. So I think you've heard of the word bootstrap. Um, now, when you, today memory, today um, operating systems like Windows 10 could be 10 GB, maybe more, 16 GB maybe, I don't know. Now, all that information is not stored when you, when you um, uh, install an operating system. That information is not stored in ROM because at the beginning we said ROM is very expensive. It cannot be so available for you to store all those files. And it's not even necessary to store all those files uh, on ROM. So what actually happens is that that information, most of those files are stored in auxiliary memory, like on the hard disk. So your computer, includes what we call the ROM on restores what we call bootstrap programs. It has a bootstrap program and that bootstrap program contains the, uh, the, the, the instructions that enable your computer to boot. That's why they call it, you know, my computer is booting. That's what it means. It, it is because it is running bootstrap memory. And those instructions in bootstrap memory enable the computer to go and fetch information from auxiliary memory wherever, wherever that Windows uh, folder is. Usually the Windows folder is on the C, is on the C uh, partition. And so it is able to go there, pick the files that it wants in its, boot, its, in its booting process, but things to do with authentication, th security, uh, pins, and these days they even have um, uh, thumbprints all that can be stored, all that information, those instructions can be stored within a bootstrap program that is very small and is stored on memory, on ROM, but all these other bulk files that are involved in an operating system will be stored on auxiliary memory. So you can see that ROM is used uh, to store bootstrap uh, programs. Data tables, uh, data table, you know data tables, I think we talked about this, da da a similar table like the one we just did actually in this course, in this uh, lecture is a data table. So you can use ROM to store data tables. Data tables store information that doesn't change, never really changes. Um, then you have data converters. So if I'm converting binary uh, to BCD, it doesn't change. Or if I'm converting decimal to BCD, it never changes. If it is my decimal is zero, I know my BCD is zero, 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 zero. If my decimal is nine, my DBD BCD will be one, zero, zero, one. If my memory, if my number, decimal number is two, seven, I know that my BCD will be, is that zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, one. It is always that. So they create a table. And so you can create uh, your data converter to be able to give you what you're looking for every time you press a certain decimal number. So you can imagine. So for instance, you have uh, a system that is generating bits like a computer, but yet you want to display those bits on a, on a monitor. A monitor uses, say, for example, seven segment uh, decoders that we looked at, which were display decoders. Then you need from between your computer output and the display, you need a data converter because that converter actually you have binary in here, you have this, uh, you have BCD here, so you need to be able to convert. And this conversion is also the same or every time, so you can use your uh, uh, ROM to do that uh, to store that conversion. Function generators are interesting, but before we go to function generators, let us look at auxiliary memory. Auxiliary memory is the sense that you can use ROM now to store information the same way you use your hard disk. 
you are you are you are auxiliaries so you can use flash drives i'm sure you guys store things on flash drives and your movies and stuff so it's the same thing now with the function generator because the function is the same also similar to like data conversion you can use um a function generator you can use rom to store a function let me show you how i'm going to create a new slide and then put this and then for okay so now i know that for instance my sign function let us say it is like that i can take a point here take a point here take a point here and so on and these are points that i can go and store in my rom so maybe this you know obviously that's a, a sign function now i can store this when i come back here after that we know that the sign function repeats it's periodical so after i get here i don't need to store any more bits so i can now decode this one to mean something obviously these are analog values so we talked about analog to division to 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 digital no digital to analog converter you know like quantization and so on and so i can give these values so let's say maybe 000010000 whatever 000010000 okay whatever number of bits i want to use depending on the accuracy i'm looking for now if maybe they are this is an 8 bit counter so 2 to the power 8 is um i think 25 uh, five six so you maybe you have your 256 points if you want a lot of accuracy now this you use the counter to count through those two 256 points and those 256 are points are kept in the sense that maybe in your first you store that in the first part of the memory you store that in the next level or or, 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 in, or in the next uh, register you store the next point in the next register you store the next point and so on and so forth so that you will store that register and then register one two three four five six all the way to that one and this is your two maybe 55th register so when you clock you start reading from the first register to the second to the third to the fourth all the way to the last and then your clock will take you back to the first one but we know that that is going to be repetitive the sine wave is periodical so that's okay now you have stored these values the ones and the zeros these these binary bits into your rom and you can see this rom is 256 by 8 meaning that each of these points is resolved into 8 bits and those are stored now every time this counter is going through you are you are reading these values and when they are read they are put through an 8 bit DAC a DAC converts the uh, the digital signal back to analog and they are passed through this is what we call a low pass filter really that's a low pass filter and what does that do it smoothes this it's it removes the the, the breaks it it will smoothen it so if you had these these things that low pass filter tends to to smooth out uh, those 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 joints and steps and so on and so you can see that I, all you need is to keep these points. You can like pre-code your sine wave before, you know, or pre-code it, you know, coding is like converting your analog to digital and then store them nicely in some sequence in the ROM so that you're able to read them in that same sequence and you will generate your uh, sine wave at the output. Okay. So let us look at a sine wave like this. Uh, let's say, for example, that we are storing sine of, of zero degrees to 90 degrees. We are going to store this in a 128 by eight ROM. That means that each, of, each degree that we store in this ROM will be coded into eight bits. Now the 128 is two to power seven. That means we have 128 words okay and so we need seven uh, addresses no we need seven address uh, bits a6 a5 a4 a3 a2 a1 a0 from all zeros to all ones okay so that will give you 28 128 sorry now it means we have 90 degrees over 128 
to find the size, the, re the resolution, or the, st the step size. Um, 128, sorry, 90 divided by 128, which is 0 0.703. So that means that when my A6 to A0 is all zero, okay, um, I'm looking at the sign of zero degrees and I can store that sign, you know, zero. If it is A, A6 to A0 is maybe 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you know, I'm, look, I'm going to be storing information for 0 0.703 degrees. If it is, if it is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, I will store for 1.406 degrees and so on. So for instance, what is, are we storing for 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0? Okay, those are 3 and 7. This is actually 2 to power 6, which is 64. What we are storing really is 64 times the resolution of 0 0.703, which is times 64, which is about uh, 45.7 degrees. I don't know why that's the case. 90 divided by 128.7 times. Yeah, so about 45.7 degrees. Actually, the, the, rate, the one that caters for 45 degrees, which is halfway, is going to be 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Are those eight? So if these are that, okay, remove that one, okay? So if you have that, you're going to have 63 times 0 0.703, which should give you about 45 degrees. Oh, 44, 44.2, that's, that's strange. 90 divided by 128 is that, times 63, 44.3. Okay, times 64, it is 45 degrees. I don't know what I'd got before. 64 times this sounds to me like it is 45 degrees. Okay, so that's okay. Just give me one second. Uh, the person has gone off. Okay, so. Just give me one, just one moment, a moment. Yeah. Okay, so I'm back. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically 45 degrees, is there at the midpoint, zero, zero. It depends on where you end up, but as we can see, it's about one, zero, 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 zero. That is relevant. Anyway, so I could ask a question like this. You know, I don't have to bring degrees. I could bring percentages. I could bring, but it, you know, you can see it really boils down back to uh, resolution and step size and the stuff that we looked at with the uh, ducks and the ADCs. Okay, now we are going to do, I think, uh, this is the, aha, uh -huh, you can see we have started semiconductor RAM. So we are done with ROM and this, uh, this slide is semiconductor RAM. And I want us to start here next time because uh, if I, I need to go. Um, have a nice day, see you Wednesday. Um, uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat>